I'm Linda Light and I'm a ceramic artist here in Kansas City and today we're going to look at some of my collection. I am a full-time ceramic artist and uh, so you'll probably see a lot of ceramics. This is the first piece of art I bought. And I'm just a, such a June Kaneko fan. Those colors are about desire too, in a way. These things are moving through life and how are these things going? I just think it's really a lovely piece. It's so great. And look at how that's moving through space. So if you look at this piece of mine, see what's happening here? I'm really interested in how to animate clay. All it wants to do is lay down on the ground and be flat, right? So how can you animate a sculpture and get it moving through space, right? That's really interesting to me. How can you make something dance and become alive, right? Hello, this Ryan Labar, I think he's in China now. He is doing something really similar. He's putting He's making all these parts and then getting them put together, which is impossible, but not that different from those stems. And I think that's what really inspires me. It's just a magical piece. And how do you get a sculpture stand that doesn't look like a refrigerator is what I want to know. <laughs> so, here's another piece with that kind of action in it that's from Mark Sutherland. And this piece plays, and it can actually wrap around a body. And then I made these pieces with him for a bunch of years with uh, some porcelain in it. That was fun. The hallway is all about politics. And this is one of my mentors, um, Howard Kotler. It's called Exhausted Glory. And he was in Seattle teaching at the University of Washington when I was um, going to school there. This is Pam Gazala, and it's a dowry. Remember when women in the old days used to have a dowry, right? In some countries they still do. This is all carved. Um, rock salt and it's you know her layers of sheets she gets to get married and that is um stephen de stabler uh, a really great ceramic artist this is richard notkin um he's a great ceramic artist and doing a lot of political work so the atom bomb and abu Ghraib. that looks like some sperms and some dead people and some barbed wire. So what's going on? It's what's going on, man, right? <laughs> and uh, that was Jesse Small. I sent him on a lightning exchange grant to China. And when he was there, he cut an entire Jeep like a piece of lace. But this is an army helmet, and it's cut with the background of money from, I forget which country, interesting and this is um, pearl handle dueling monkey wrenches um, good for a family fight right let's see when in 1990 I went to Latvia and this was the first guy I met Pederis Martinsons and um, he was an architect a Latvian architect but during the Soviet times no architects were allowed to practice unless they were Russian. Not everybody was happy with what was going on, so if you, if you were a sculptor or a painter, you had to toe the party line and do party art or you're out. Most of the great art was in the craft medium because it wasn't considered an art form and they could do a little more. This is uh, Joris Bergens. And here's Marx. And this is a teapot, it pours out the banana. They did not have a grape or a banana in the Soviet Union for 40 years. They would have died. When it first opened, honey, every trash can in the country was this high with banana peels because honey. And then they had banana soda pop, banana chewing gum, banana everything. Because <laughs> I mean, they would have traded the country for a banana in a second. <laughs> Did you know that there are, oh easy, I'm, this is a very conservative estimate, at least 360 million guns in this country, 
50 million more guns than there are humans. I didn't know it, but I started doing the research and I thought, my God, we are bowing down to guns. This was the first piece, it's called 44 Magnum Mandala. Some people say that I might be celebrating firearms, but I want to start a conversation and how do we do that? What was democracy founded on civil discourse? It wasn't founded on having guns. You have to speak to each other. Our founding fathers didn't agree on a lot of things, you know. So really, is this democracy? No, it's not. You want light? It's a Richard Hollander. He was my uncle. Oh yeah, he was he was a character. Blue jean shirt and an ascot. Man, he was cool. He was a really good looking guy. So there was a portrait of him there and there was one in the other room. But he was a very good looking guy. <laughs> There's a portrait of him. I had it up. <laughs> he looks mean and disturbed, doesn't he? He was a funny guy. He was great. <laughs> This is a portrait of my daughter. Will Cotton is the artist, and uh, he's, um, my daughter lives with him for 20-something years now. Uh, yeah, I was trying to squeeze a portrait out of him for a long time. <laughs> I even bought Rose a dress for it and all this stuff so to look like a sergeant, but anyhow, I finally got this. So it's a sugar crystal bustier and a cotton candy skirt, and then he makes these <laughs> um, tiaras. He did this uh, is um, the ice cream icebergs from Frederick Church. Both of these are about desire, and a lot of my work is about desire too, and how do you feel that out? And so he's just have a glut of sweets, and then he makes all these too. Him and my daughter make all these things, and then and then he paints them. It's really fun. This piece is um, from my uncle Richard. It's called Sixty Footer. <laughs> he was a little lazy, but yeah, he worked some. They had incredible art in the house. My God, they had maca, we had everything. And we were also very fortunate to grow up with so much wonderful art. You know, my grandmother was a collector, my parents, my mother collected, and she was just obsessed about color. We're big color insanity people. Enough, enough. And it's the same color peach. Good flesh. Sex and flesh, right? You know, and I really like color. And color, how, why do we collect? because I want to find something that inspires me and gives me joy and stimulates my mind. Well, that goes for color too. Because I, you know, as I said, I'm kind of synesthetic. I can smell color, I can feel it. I, I know, you know what I mean? So, well, you might not know what I mean, but <laughs> I know what I mean, so. <laughs> so it's very inspirational. I've got one upstairs too. And oh my God, does he know how to get the essentials into things? He's really amazing. There's another stack house. God, this is boat coming through the light and dripping. It looks so ominous and terrifying. Man, what a picture. I mean, he's just in the ether, isn't he? 
I had it matted in black, man. It about sunk the whole room. It looked so dark. <laughs> I had to get that done over. This guy, uh, Arneson, was one of my heroes in the ceramic world. And I don't have a piece of his, but I was lucky to get this print. And it's called Up Against It. And oh my god, could he draw or what? He's so good. It interests me to find an iconic image and then take notice of it and see what is truly American, things that we just take for granted and, and enlarge it. And he really did a lot of that, and I was working on it. And I'll take you in uh, the kitchen and show you a piece that's of interest to me. So uh, here's these pencil peaks here. You see these pencils down there? That, or even these uh, monkey wrench mandala, or this, even this bronze rag I made. Taking something that is common and then uh, glorifying it. We're gonna make a banana today. So the first thing I have to do is wedge the clay, get it ready to work. So that there's no air bubbles or anything and I can take a look. That looks pretty good. A banana has a lot of connotations, you know? <laughs> it's silly, it's fun, it draws you in, it's yellow but it also has a lot of connotations about sex, right? And um, I've been interested in uh, sex appropriation for a lot of my work. What makes the world go? <laughs> I made a lot of bananas and I know what they look like. I've looked at a bunch of them. Shit, this is way more fun. <laughs> Yeah. Don't forget to sign your name. Want me to read a quote? Let's see. Dr. Taktiana's sex advice to all creation. If not for sex, much of what is flamboyant and beautiful in nature would not exist. Plants would not bloom. Birds would not sing. Deer would not sprout antlers. Hearts would not beat so fast. For flowering plants, sex is trusting the wind or an insect to carry pollen to a receptive female flower. So a male flower who wishes to be a Lothario and have his pollen strewn to as many mates as possible must seduce not female flowers, but bees. Other creatures must wear gaudy costumes, be they fancy feathers or frivolous fins. They must sing and dance for hours and hours. They must perform prodigious feats, building and rebuilding nests and bowers. In short, they must expend enormous amounts of energy, shouting, choose me, choose me. <laughs> so, I mean, what is making our world happen and go forward? And so that has been a lot of the thrust of my work. Um, I want to speak about women's issues and then procreation, sex, death. These things were about um, um, my friend Richard Nadeau died. I lost a couple friends that year. And then, you know, so how do we get through life and what makes us go? Anyhow, you're not filming me, are you? Is that right? Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do with all this shit? Where do you put all the extra crap? <laughs>